this is the fourth uh, lecture on this uh, subject of uh, the rapport between relationship between uh, religion and Canadian art. The, the three first one were dealing basically with uh, religion as a kind of collective phenomenon. Uh, when I spoke of the First Nation and then of the manifestation that you find in New France at the beginning and then up to Osias Le Duc, you could say then the Relig religion was a kind of a collective experience. It was not just a thing of individual. Today, that's exactly what we will find. Uh, we will find much more personalized, if you want, uh, religious experience in two, basically in two painters that we will speak today. Uh, Lauren Harris, uh, who is known uh, because of the group of seven and also because of the nice uh, sum of money that his painting can get him <laughs> when he's dead. And... Uh, and then the other Himiri car, and I want to, to show also the, the, the way they encounter each other and the way they influence each other. Uh, for them, of course, uh, religious experience will be a much more individual affair. And uh, this makes them maybe closer to our time. Uh, as a French author, it's called Marcel Gauchet, uh, I've written about that, what he called the disenchantment du monde, meaning that uh, we are more and more um, getting out of religion in the sense that religion is no more controlling uh, completely the whole society, except, of course, in some certain form of integrism or fundamentalism, of which uh, <laughs> I cannot uh, bear once again. But anyway, except on, in this type of context, religion doesn't have anymore the control on society that he used to have, uh, on one hand. And on the other hand, what Gauchet says, he says we, we assist to in a kind of individuation of the religious experience. To believe become uh, um, uh, a matter of individual and not of, of a society in general. And in that sense, uh, I would say our two uh, artists of today are quite typical of this type of attitude. If you uh, start with Harris, uh, Harris come from a very, I was surprised, a very religious family. His grandfather was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, he have two uncles also who were ministers, one of the Baptist church, the other Presbyterian. His uh, mother was a Christian scientist, uh, devotee and quite active. So you could say that Harris started in a very religious type of surrounding. Uh, but uh, he went to Europe and especially in, in Germany and then detached himself uh, of this type of con more conventional and more defined type of religion, become, let's say, still preoccupied by religious issue, but in a more uh, detached way, not as a, a kind of a devoted practicing uh, Christian. And uh, the first uh, big influence, I would say, that uh, was important for him, uh, it is from this man, uh, we call uh, Dr. Salem Bland, and uh, he made this incredible portrait of him uh, uh, in 1925. And uh, they, uh, we, we know from other uh, witnesses at the time that uh, Harris was impressed by the thought and by the, let's see, the ideas of, of this man. Uh, he was, uh, as you know, uh, wealthy enough not to need. Uh, to have, uh, uh, let's see, people asking him to make their portrait for money and things like that. So if he made the, the portrait of this man, it is because he was interested in him. You know, he didn't need money. He, uh, he, he inherited of the Massey Harris uh, uh, money, so I guess he, he never had the problem with money. God bless him. And the... Uh, and the what happened with this thinker, let's say, he was a Methodist minister, and in the beginning, in, King, in the region of Kingston, uh, he started to, to, to preach, let's say, of the importance of the Sabbath and the importance of not drinking too much. Uh, that quite conventional, but suddenly, he became more and more interested in social issues. And this you can understand also by the context. You see, you are just after the First World War. In 1917, you have the Russian Revolution. And uh, people become to think that these social issues were crucial. And of course, in the evangelical milieu from which uh, Salem Bland came from, 
They decided that uh, they had in the gospel itself um, a way to uh, create a kind of new social um, attitude and eventually to influence, let's say, the, uh, the government at the time, making law were more closer to the poor and, uh, and, uh, and in a way, uh, making uh, a, a different type of surrounding. Bland used to say that religion should not uh, just look for heaven, but should bring heaven on earth. Uh, and uh, because of that, well, he, he will defend, let's say, in a kind of little uh, social uh, committee in which he was, idea like the week of 40 hours. Uh, now it's, of course, much behind us, but uh, in, in, when he did it in 1917, I think the idea of working only eight hours a day was wonderful. That was something that was not seen. Uh, he was also for... Uh, that's a good idea, you still have, uh, we, we should not get there. Instead of putting taxation on things who are necessary to live, to put it on luxury instead. Uh, we, we are not yet there. And uh, he had so, kind of social ideas that in fact we'll, we will find in the legal system, uh, the Canadian legal system will adopt some of these things uh, through their influence and uh, he will, uh, uh, in his mind, it was a way also to avoid the extreme uh, revolutionary type of ideology that you had in Russia at the time, for instance. Uh, it was a way for the evangelical to maybe reach to, the, uh, to uh, uh, similar end, but without uh, violence and without religion. He says, for instance, that we're quite, uh, sorry, he argued that the distinct task of the age was to abolish modern capitalism in order that democracy be fully realized. Uh, this is quite close, of course, to, to revolution. And when you think of that, of this kind of social issue, I think it explains certain picture of Harris, to my mind, it was always difficult a little bit to understand if you try to put them in the, uh, the complete oeuvre of, of Harris. For instance, you, you have probably seen the reproduction of this thing and says, what is this? Why to make a, such a grim picture? You see the, the black court in Halifax. It, it reminds me a little bit, you, you read probably the, the, the book of uh, uh, McCourt, Angela Hashes. Uh, this is the type of uh, description, let's say, that will fit completely to, to this, what you, what you see there. And indeed, what, what Harris did, it was to try to express in his picture the type of uh, reaction, let's say, that a man like Samuel, Salem Bland uh, will have, you know, that these are not condition of living normal for human being, it should be changed, it should, we should do it through, uh, maybe through legal means, but it, it, it's unacceptable. Like, uh, uh, let's see, uh, a critic of the time, Augustus Bridle, wrote about this uh, picture, he says, black court is despondent with only a note of humanity in order to show that nobody should live in such a place at all. Uh, and uh, it's exactly, of course, the mood of the picture and what Harris wanted to, to convey. You see kids uh, playing in a kind of terrible place where, where there's no road, there's no court, there's nothing, and just these grim house also all around. The same remark could be done about this painting also done a little bit later in uh, Glace Bay, so near uh, Halifax this time, and uh, uh, who were depicting uh, miners' houses, uh, were done, of course, by the company, and uh, kind of uh, around the, the, the miner shaft that you see in the, in the, the beginning. So the, the miners' house were all that around them, and one behind the other, all the same. And of course, it is the same idea uh, that he wanted to denounce. Uh, he, he wrote himself, Aris, about this uh, painting, he says, here we see the hard bare fact they are underlying the industrial uh, machine and it's not a pretty sight. Uh, these people strain every nerve for a way out, look everywhere for a ray of hope, search all men for solution where perhaps there is none. They constantly face starvation, they face the sight of wives and children suffering from squalor and privation and hunger, they face utter dejection complete loss of faith in mankind. Uh, this is the type of discourse that you don't expect uh, from uh, Harris at first sight, but uh, which is explainable, I think, in the context of this Methodist uh, pastor that he knew that his minister, uh, Salem Bland. Uh, and he, even in the Canadian Forum, who was a rather a leftist type of uh, publication, Harris really uh, underlined the, the, the problem by this engraving here where you see the same type of houses 
behind, but he put this personage a little bit a la Munch, huh? I would say. Uh, you, you remember this famous painting of Munch, uh, where the, the cry, uh, a little bit of the same type of, uh, but there really to denounce quite clearly uh, what was happening. So this is probably one of the first influence on Harris uh, that opened him to social issue, but also in a, a true a, an evangelical uh, type of approach. I, th I think that's what's important. It's not just social issue, but also seen through the eyes of Salem Bland. Uh. The other big uh, influence on him also was theosophy. Uh, uh, theosophy was, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to define, but let's see. It was a kind of esoteric doctrine. I think we can say that. Um, divided by this uh, lady that I show, uh, show you a portrait here, Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, uh, with a name like this, she's certainly Russian, but apparently she was uh, also uh, writing in French and English. And um, she wrote a book, it's called The Sec Secret Doctrine. Uh, doctrine. And um, this was, of course, the, the main uh, uh, gospel, I would say in bracket, of uh, the Theosophic movement. Believe, uh, Basically, what they, what they believe it is that the divinity is manifests itself in the, uh, the world. Huh? But each, uh, and, and it does it more and more clearly with time. Because they imagine that there was a kind of a cyclical evolution like this, that the world uh, have passed through many phases in which this manifestation of the divinity was clearer and clearer each time because, let's say, uh, it was like cumulative. Uh, so they imagine that you will have many, many um, cycles before the one in which we live, and there will be others also with time. The idea also that with time we will detach ourselves more and more from, uh, let's say, uh, visual uh, sensation, and we will be more able of abstraction and then of uh, reaching the absolute of, of God. Uh, so, uh, summarized that way, it looks, uh, well, you, you could disagree or agree, but it looks more or less reasonable. I try to put my, can we say that, put my nose in uh, more uh, uh, in the closer to their stuff, and then I, I must say I was a little bit astonished. For instance, Mrs. Blavatsky was convinced that uh, she didn't invent her theosophy. She received it from what she called the adept. The adept, of course, is the great wise man of the antiquity. And uh, she throws like this from time to time terms that I could not check. For instance, she says it, it's a typical case of tulku. And Tulku is a Tibetan uh, uh, concept. So I was not in Tibet, I <laughs> know nothing about Tibetan concept. But what she explained, it says uh, this great adept have the possibility of taking a part of his consciousness and embodied it in one of her dis or his disciple. And then he have the same power and the same knowledge, let's say, that the master. Uh, she wrote, for instance, uh, in letters, um, uh, master, as if she, she referred to one of these adepts that speak to her uh, directly. Master find that it's too difficult for me to be looking consciously into the astral light for my secret doctrine. And so it is now about a fortnight, I see large and long rolls of paper on which things are written and I recollect them. Yeah. Thus all the patriarchs from Adam to Noah were given me to see parallel with the rishis, and in the middle, between them, the meaning of their symbol and personification. Well, this is very uh, a wonderful way to write. You just get your inspiration with paper all written, and you just have to copy them. I must say, this aspect, this kind of esoteric aspect, is uh, very foreign to me. But nevertheless, it's true that uh, theosophy had uh, an immense influence, let's say, on many, and especially on artists, because this idea of uh, getting more and more abstract with time have, of course, touched a certain aspect. One that you should know that was very much uh, influenced by theosophy is Piet Mondrian. Uh, uh, Mrs. Blavatsky doesn't speak too much of art in her, in, in her works. Uh, she speaks more of philosophy and uh, of, uh, also a lot of uh, oriental uh, things. But um, uh, Mondrian met a man who is called Schoenmaker, uh, who was one of his neighbors, 
an ex-Catholic priest, but turned theosophist, if you want. And he wrote a book which is called The New Image of the World. Uh, new, uh, I cannot say it uh, properly in Dutch, but it sounds like, like in German a little bit, like uh, the Verel Bild, uh, the, the Verel World, if you want, like in English, and build like a picture, the new image of the world. And uh, in this, uh, should make her explain that with time we should be able to reduce our vision of the world with its basic structure. And what are the basic structure? He says this is the vertical and the horizontal. And uh, he makes a series of opposition between matter and spirit, uh, high and low, uh, masculine and feminine. You can imagine where the masculine is, of course, with high and not with low. And uh, a kind of uh, opposition like this will be more or less expressed by this division between vertical and horizontal and the right angle, let's say. It's so close to, to what Montréal says, uh, and in a way also so foreign to him also, because of course you, don't, you cannot make painting only with ideas. Huh? You need also a tradition. You have really to make decision to, to reduce, let's say, your painting just to three basic color like here, or, or uh, vertical and horizontal. Even if you read about it, you have to transform it in a picture. So Montréal of all is, uh, uh, is uh, importance like that. But it's interesting that because of Schoenmaker, Tra trying to translate in terms of culture, in terms of art, what he believed uh, through, uh, through this theosophy, this idea of uh, being, uh, getting more and more abstract and more and more able to see the spirituality, you see, directly, that you could have uh, an expression of that kind in uh, uh, a famous painter like Mondrian. Uh, okay, so that's give you a, a, a small idea, let's say, of the beginning of uh, of uh, Harris, the two main influence, let's say this more evangelical social influence, and also this theosophy. Theosophy could be seen also as a kind of way to evade social issue, uh, because if you are in the big abstraction and you are above everything, then maybe they, they have tendency to recede in behind. Uh, with Emily Carr, we have also a beginning of the same type, very religious family to start with, I you show I show you her parents here. The father used to uh, uh, direct the prayer of his family at 7:45 every day. Uh, he, uh, they, they bring they went to uh, service, of course, on, on Shabbat, and the uh, and the uh, uh, the mother also was also very pious. So you could see that Emily Carr at the beginning had the same type of uh, uh, of beginning like Harris huh, in the very religious family. And then, like him, uh, she lost, uh, let's say, track of faith through a trip, not in Germany like uh, Harris, but in England, uh, when she went to study, and in England and France, and then she, she forget about uh, these things. She always remained interested in religious issue, but didn't find, like Harris, the uh, possibility, let's say, to, uh, to find in theosophy, let's say, uh, something equivalent of her belief. You could say, uh, in her case, it, le it was left a little bit in a limbo like this without clear uh, way to translate it before she met Harris, of course. When, she will meet, when they will meet, then suddenly uh, it will be a very uh, important, let's say, uh, uh, she will say one uh, later, I guess that long talk in Lauren Harris' studio was the, pi the pivot on which turned my entire life. So uh, she gave a lot of importance of it. Uh, so that's why I think the first, the first thing is, uh, how did they meet, you know? She was, of course, in the West completely. Harris is a man of Toronto. What, what was the circumstances, let's see, of their meeting? Well, it's a little bit strange. The um, director of the National Gallery at the time was Mr. Eric Brown. And uh, an anthropologist who will be, uh, become very famous also, a French-Canadian, it's called Marius Barbeau, decided to make an exhibition of uh, Indian art, let's see, of uh, native uh, art, and to put in parallel with that modern works, or what they call in a, not a very gentle fashion, of our more sophisticated artists, uh, in bracket, uh, this is not nice for the, uh, for the natives, but the, uh, to put together these two trends, let's say, of native and modern, and uh, like Eric Brown says, to show if there is any relationship between both, see if you could speak of influence, let's say, of native art on uh, 
the so-called sophisticated artists on one hand, or the opposite, if you, you could say that the native artists have been influenced by. So he, he, he thought of uh, putting the two together will create uh, a, a, an interesting exhibition. The other thing, I, and I think this is more the input of Marius Barbeau, it was to, um, uh, cr uh, to try to convince the Canadian public of the importance of native art uh, and to show uh, that how important it was. So this was they had in mind and how they suddenly thought of, uh, of uh, this is the title, let's say this is the cover of the, uh, the exhibition, you see National Gallery of Canada, exhibition of Canadian West Coast art, native and modern. It's exactly what I, in December, 1927. How they got Emily Carr involved in this, because she, if you have to realize that she was not known at all. Huh? Uh, Barbo will say later that he already knew a little bit of her, he bought two of her painting and all that, but this have never been really established clearly. What it seems, there was one man in the West who's called Mortimer Lamb who bought some of her picture and tried to interest Eric Brown at the time to, uh, for, to her work of Emile Carr. And he was answered by Brown, well, this is very interesting, but it's better for a provincial museum than to a national museum. I uh, meaning that uh, we don't need that at all. If he knew it <laughs> at the time <laughs> which kind of uh, treasure he was putting aside, but anyway. And then Barbu saw some of a picture in February 1927. So we speak a very, very, like almost a year before. And he says to Eric Brown, it seems to me quite interesting because for your show, she have a lot of picture in which we see Indian artifacts and landscape and you could put the two together and maybe it will be interesting. And Eric Brown indeed went to Victoria, met Emily Carr and got bowled over. And he's very enthusiastic, and he will always repeat that it's him who discovered Emily Carr. But in fact, <laughs> what we can establish, I think clearly, the first one we discover, it's herself in a way, because she wrote to Barbeau one year before in 26 to say, I'm making Indian uh, uh, subject, maybe you could be interested to see them. Uh, and that's, I think, the way Barbeau heard about her uh, because of her letter, never went to see it, of course, at the moment, then heard, saw some painting uh, nearby in Azul Town, and then finally uh, Eric Brown goes on the spot and they, they, they uh, decided to include her. And indeed they did more than that, they asked her to make the design of the cover of this catalog. If you look it, now here in this corner, yeah, you see a signature, Kliwik. Yeah? Kliwik means the one who laugh, and this is the nickname that the Indians give to Emily Carr. Uh, because, of course, she didn't know their language, so she was just smiling and laughing, he, he, all the time, so what can you do? And so they call her Kliwik, and she kept the, this, uh, there's one of her book, is called like this, as you know, uh, Kliwik, uh, souvenir of her uh, design. Uh, and among the, the artists represented in this show, uh, I have here the list, I think, I could, yeah, there was Jackson, A.Y. Jackson, of course, uh, there was also Han Savage, that some of you may know, Peggy Nicole, and a sculptor Florence Weil. Emily Carr had a lot of pictures there in this show, finally. And there was two other painters less known, let's see, and I will just show you uh, briefly an example of each one. Uh, this is Lang Langdon Kin. I think I show you once one of his pictures in uh, the first lecture I gave, I think. Uh, he's an American painter that Barbo used to love very much. Uh, he's not a great artist. Uh, between us, it's a more an illustrator than an artist. But Barbo thought, wow, this is great. He's really realistic. He will bring uh, attention to this type of art. Huh? What Barbo wanted to do, it is to first to salvage, probably to save um, all the manifestation of Indian art along the Skeena River uh, in, the, in the north. I think I'll show you on a map uh, wh where it was before. And uh, the idea was more than that, was to make a kind of provincial park around it. And that's why he, he got in contact with the uh, Canadian National Railway System in order to, for them it was interesting because it was a way to attract tourists in that region and to have people taking the train to go there. Uh. And his plan was to involve some artists to bring them on the Skinner River. They will make picture 
And these pictures will be sold, will be reproduced, they, they, people will speak about, and it will be like a, a publicity plot, let's say, to, for developing a touristic region. Uh, I think it's more or less what, what is behind. That's why it became very important for him to solve, to save the totem. Uh, and for the population, of course, in the north, along the Skina River, they were a little bit confused about this because for a while they were told that this is ridiculous, this is pagan, they should destroy all these things. And now, on the contrary, they had an anthropologist saying, save them, don't break them. We, we need them to attract tourists in your region. Yeah? You see, that there was a, uh, I, I, I don't want to put down too much Monsieur Barbeau because he, he really worked all his life uh, to really make this work known. But, uh, but there was, uh, it's not just a kind of a, a pure intention. You, you have to see a little bit the context in which uh, it was done. So a picture like that by Langdon Kin, this American that he brought there, uh, in a way uh, illustrate very much uh, what I just said, you see. So uh, Langdon Kin is known to have been not too uh, very precise in his conception of uh, Indian art. It looks Indian, but it's not. For instance, in this one, he explained that on the top you have an eagle there, and it's related to the clan of eagle, and then you have an ancestor, and then you have a thunderbird, and then another ancestor, as if it was a kind of genealogical tree, you know, and this is not the way uh, totem pole works, you know, They're just like this, like, like what we'll do a, 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 a genealogical chart uh, for, for, our, uh, for ourselves. Huh? The other uh, artist that uh, was also included in the show and was less known is this Walter Phillips, huh? And uh, you see here the, uh, his, his print, in fact, it's, a, it's a rather a print than, uh, uh, than a painting. And here I put uh, on in parallel the sources, I think, where, where he took his material. For instance, he speak of uh, this house that was built uh, in a kind of very modern fashion by a chief in the, the village of uh, uh, Kalugwist. Uh, in, in the north there. And uh, the chief used to live, of course, in a kind of more traditional home, but he, it got destroyed. And he saved two big uh, statues that you see on each side here and a totem pole in front. That's what you see here. Uh, that were holding, in fact, the, the main posts in the older house. Uh, you have to imagine a house in which, instead of having just a column, let's say, you have a personage uh, with this gesture. And thinking maybe to be funny, I don't know what, he put a keg of beer in the hand of each one. You see, uh, you see them a little bit. And, of, uh, and Phillips find it also funny, and so he made it, uh, he made this guy, you see, planting the... And then the, uh, the totem pole who's here come from this one, who is in a completely different village. And this is typical of this art inspired by the native people, not very attentive to the real context and to the signification of these work uh, done by uh, the uh, natives and just tr trying to, to, um, to make a kind of, uh, uh, I, would, I would say, an hybrid, uh, say a kind of mixture of all this and, uh, and, and uh, doing like that. So the exhibition now, when you enter in it, that's the way it looked. Huh? It was... Uh, in the National Gallery of the time, not, not in the building of today, of course. Huh? It was like uh, uh, what we, we call now the Museum of Man, but it's kind of uh, more on the inside of Ottawa. Uh, and uh, you could see here, I, I, I tell you, uh, I just signaled them, because these are four drawings of Old Gate. Huh? Old Gate was part of that show. And uh, let's see. I tried to reconstruct them. Let's see, you, this one will be this one here. And these two, uh, these two, but the, the fourth one I've not found yet. Uh, maybe somebody will, will uh, tell me that it's there. Uh, you just go upstairs and you will find it, but I haven't, I've not. And uh, okay, this, uh, one of the artists that Marius Barbeau brought in on the Skina River was Olgate. Uh, and in the present exhibition, if you go there, there's a part of a wall devoted to this aspect of his work. Um, contrary to others, he made a lot of portraits of these chiefs. Some of them uh, were not very happy of this, especially Chief Combe that you see here. 
and uh, decided not to look at him and not to speak to him except through interpret and never directly, not looking at him at all. The, this hostility is understandable because they felt that what was coming, it was this wave of tourism. Huh? These were the first ones who were coming, these artists with Monsieur Barbeau and all that. But then you will have the tourists, we will have to uh, readapt our life completely. So they were not too happy. Certain of the village in which they wanted to go refused to receive them completely. So Barbeau was, uh, uh, excuse him himself, let's go to the next village where we cannot do more with, the, with these people. So Allgate did uh, his best. And also there is a certain um, kind of anthropological accuracy to these drawings that is very cold in a way. Huh? It's not, he, he, he described them as uh, a photographer would have done. You see face and, face and profile, almost like, uh, say, when you go to the police and you see the, the picture of the banditim, you know, for all the, the bandits. Huh? The, the painting was here in the middle is a painting by Emily Carr. Huh? Uh, that I, I think it's uh, is this painting, Totem Paul in Kitseul Kla. If you look carefully, you will see this one uh, correspond to this Totem Paul. The one. It's a little bit like see the the game children likes uh, find the seven error in picture. <laughs> it's a little bit of type of uh, ability that you have to develop to to find out that. And uh, since uh, we know from anthropologists exactly the story of this temple, you will see how different it is from what I was describing with Langon Kin. It is, of course, related to the story of one family, of one clan. But the story goes, in this case, uh, in the, uh, more or less in this word. They says, we went to hunt for a kind of mythical bird. It was called the Weenil. And, but we were not in our normal ground of hunting. You see, we were like in neighbors. And because of that, suddenly the hurt opened before us and we fell in a kind of pit. But we were clever enough to, um, to make a kind of, scale, uh, kind of ladder, let's say, to get out. And uh, so this is what our less, more or less what it described in the poll. You have on the top this kind of crisscross uh, uh, shape that correspond to the house where uh, they were living, where they, that they quit. And then you have the personage who go to hunting. Then you have the bird, the mythical bird, you say with a long beak, of course, who is not uh, realistic. And finally, you have these people also who are supposed to, uh, to wear the animals of the other territory under their arms, you see, saying we were uh, in, in ground where we should not have been. And this is a representation of the scale or the ladder, let's say, that they make by taking a post and just uh, digging little hole in it, and they were able to save themselves like this. So there is a story, but it's not a genealogical story like this is my ancestor and the father of the father and the father, say, like Langonkin uh, examined. Uh, well, just to give you an example of that. Another shot done at the same exhibition in which you see two pictures of Emily Carr on each side here. And you see the strange mixture it was. Huh? It's kind of juxtaposition of uh, work of art from the native and then this painting without any relationship, in fact. If one of the intention was to show that one is the source of the other, it was not very efficient. Except that here, on this corner, the, this thing here, is done by Emily Carr also. Huh? It's a little bit in the style of the cover she made for the catalog of the exhibition meaning that she did some rugs or pottery like that that she was selling to tourists and never considered it as an important part of her work. But she was doing that for a living, you see, uh, uh, in, taking Indian motif like this and, in, and including them in craft in, uh, in kind of uh, like a rug like here. So here, say you have real, a real mixture of everything. Here you have sculpt authentic sculpture. This is a C.C. Utul, of course, and uh, authentic uh, uh, sculpture of uh, Indian and painting of America, and suddenly a rug also that she did. Uh, another example of one of her painting, this one is probably this one, Tanu, uh, Queen Charlotte Islands, uh, 1913. It's all, 
at the time, in 27, of course, all these paintings of America are older. And that was one of her, her arguments. She said, I visited these places before they removed the totem and sell them to the museum and all that. I said, and uh, I have a more genuine, let's say, approach than, but what exactly these, these ladle do around her work, I have no idea. So again, it's, uh, see, if they wanted to, to create an idea of a kind of a, uh, relationship between the two hearts, it's more a juxtaposition of both, uh, not really a relationship. Uh, uh, the exhibition was not a success, <laughs> in a way. When, when they opened it, uh, Emily Carr was very severe on that. She says, the exhibition has opened, and I might almost say open and closed again. It was horrid. Uh, what happened apparently, or the publicity was badly done, or it was too soon for this type of exhibition, yeah? and the public didn't go. She says, it was dead, dismal failure, the big rooms with the picture hanging in the soft, pleasant light were almost empty, the grand old totem with their gray stern faces gazed tensely ahead alongside kin, uh, gay blanketed Indians with their blind eyes. I was glad they were blind. Uh, they could not see the humiliation. Uh, and, uh, and apparently, she, she attacked also Brown on this. She says he, she took the side of Marius Barbeau. She says Barbeau was uh, aghast. He was certainly a man who used to call, to, uh, to talk a lot and all that, was certainly very silentious. And uh, apparently, Brown have not take care too much of the publicity. And uh, so nobody came. And he told them all the time, that ah, it will be a fantastic show. Everything will go well. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And suddenly you are in front. And Emilica says, when we came, she came with Marius Barbeau and his wife. And she says, when we came, there was no, no one in the room. And he says, we're, we're too early. But she says, it remains like that. See? This is terrible, of course, when you exhibit something and nobody comes. So after, when the, the show traveled a little bit, it was shown in Toronto. What you see here is not the same room. Huh? It's in Toronto. And uh, here, the painting on the wall is this one that we have here in the collection of Museum of Fine Arts. That's why it's interesting to see them uh, together. It, it represents one of the boat of the Nukta people with probably a wolf uh, image on it. And then you see the village of Allard Bay in, in the back there. And uh, the, uh, when it was shown in Toronto, uh, Jackson and Lismer took charge of it and they organized, uh, let's see, a film presentation, a concert with Indian songs and a lot of things to attract the people and it was less, uh, uh, less terrible than in Ottawa. But, but it shows also, say, I, you remember when I uh, gave you the first lecture, I says we have to be careful not to present just an aesthetic approach to these work. But in a way, even that uh, was not really solved because the aesthetic um, quality of these work was not evident for anybody, in fact. Uh, that's why the public didn't show up. And uh, so Barbo could be said, okay, maybe he didn't see all the implication, all the political implication, all that of these work, but he was at least trying to give them a certain, uh, uh, I would say, uh, to, to, uh, that they would be seen at a certain quality and a certain level. Huh? Okay, so this is the exhibition where Emily Carr hand up. So she was, of course, in, in Victoria, and uh, Eric Brown decided to invite her to see the, the opening of the show. Like I told you, she came and, and she, is, she says it was dismal. On the way, she was given the book of uh, Fred Hauser, the first book written about the group of seven. And she lived through it and she got interested in it and she saw this picture of Iris in the book. Uh, of course, in a black and white uh, reproduction. And uh, she was impressed by it. And she says, I must stop in Toronto on my way, huh? you have to imagine that she's coming from the West, she must stop in, in Toronto to meet these artists that I'm told that uh, will be part of the show also, and I, I, I would like to, to meet them. Huh? And it's exactly what she did. And then she was brought to the famous uh, studio building where the group of seven had their studios. Huh? So for instance, Harris had a room there, and uh, McDonald, another one, and, and so she could visit one artist after the other. She was very impressed by her visit at Harris Place. 
Uh, of course, we don't know exactly which kind of painting he had on the wall, but imagine a painting of that style because of the date, 1924. It could be or this one or another one of that uh, style. She says that she lost completely uh, her, her capacity of, of speech. It was like so fantastic in her eyes that she didn't know uh, what to say. And she says she looked like a dumb dumbfounded fool in front of Harris, but it, uh, in fact it's not true. Harris it was a nice gentleman and he explained his painting as much as he can. And when she came back to her hotel this night, she wrote in her diary the, the following, say, oh God, what I have seen. Huh? Really, and, and it is, it reflects well the impact of both the personality of Harris and soon enough of his idea, but also of his painting. Huh? Where I've been, she says, something has spoken to the very soul of me, wonderful, mighty, not of this world. You will see the, the way she described it is very uh, almost religious, I would say. Dumb notes have struck chords of wonderful tone. Something has called out somewhere. Something in me is trying to answer. And later she said, what language do they speak? Those silent, awful spaces, I do not know. Wait and listen, you shall hear by and by. I long to hear and yet I'm half afraid. I think perhaps I shall find God there. The God I've longed and hunted and failed to find. Always it seems nearer out in the big spaces, sometimes almost within reach, but never quite. Perhaps in this newer, wider space, filled vision, I shall find him. Huh? So then I would say, uh, this kind of religious experience she had before in her childhood and was, she was uh, cut off from, then come back through the picture of Iris, in a way. Uh, and what she described, in fact, it could be seen as a kind of an experience of the sublime. Uh, she dwarfed herself, she's like no, nobody in front of a huge space. When you get this kind of quantification, you are in front of the sublime. This is one of the definitions that Immanuel Kant gave of the sublime, the, the, big, the, the big scene, the big thing, the things who is bigger than what we can really grasp and, and touch. Uh, when you have this quantity, let's see, you have this. So here is the space, of course, this kind of empty, huge space. Uh, in comparison to that, her visit to the McDonald's studio was less, she was less impressed. Huh? I, again, I cannot guarantee that she saw this painting in particular. She named another one that I will show you just after. But he says about McDonald's, she said, Monsieur McDonald's canvases were big and fine, lovely design and sometimes good color, sometimes good color, <laughs> this is terrible. Artists are very bitchy one uh, with the other, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, at other time, I found them a little hot and heavy and earthy. Well, it's, it could, could be a good description of this one. I enjoy them greatly, but without thrill. They wake few emotion in me. The Tangle Garden I like about the best. The Tangle Garden, you know the, this picture of uh, McDonald. It's uh, quite famous. It's at the National Gallery in Ottawa. And uh, she felt closer to that. Uh, than the, uh, the Montreal River picture that I just showed you. In fact, the one who impressed her really was Aris. Huh? And Aris invited her to, uh, to come back uh, to visit him and all that, but uh, she was in Toronto. She says, no, I have to go to Ottawa, but on my, my way back, I will, I will go to you and I will try to, to see you again. Huh? And uh, she went to Ottawa. The show was uh, shown here also in Montreal. She came to Montreal to see it also. And again, the same remark. She says, sometimes when you enter the gallery, the other painting die. And, and she referred to a series of painting of mountain and lake like this one of Aris. Of course, when you see that in, in a show of the group of seven, of course, they, they are stunning. They are quite different. Huh? She says, a different world. And this is always that dignity and spirituality that uh, st uh, struck her. Uh, on the way back, she visited again Harris, and he did the same thing. He showed him, he showed her uh, her painting, but now this time in his house, uh, uh, and he put some music in the background, which was a perfect. Uh, uh, <laughs> And he showed a painting of, of, of that style. Let's say they were done in, in Jasper. Uh, the, he was with Jackson at the time. 
And both of them went in the mountain like this, and Aris created this stunning picture, you see, with the reflection of the water, in a place that apparently didn't inspire much Jackson. Jackson says it was a dead place, there was no vegetation, nothing, and he, he didn't feel that he could do anything about it, but Harris find right away the, uh, the way to, to create this uh, space and all that. And uh, so you can imagine Emily being there in front of this great man with this huge, beautiful picture with little uh, uh, romantic music in the background. Madame Harris just knitting, <laughs> as it should shut up. <laughs> Okay, to s alors she wrote, to sit in front of those pictures and hear that music was just about heaven. I have never felt anything like the power of those canvases. They seem to have called to me from some other world, sort of an answer to a great longing. Again, this idea of uh, uh, an answer to a longing. And I came through the mountains, I longed so to cast off my earthly body and float away through the great pure spaces between the peaks, up the quiet green ravi ravines into the high pure clean air. Mr. Harris has painted those very spaces and my spirit seems able to leave my body and roam among them, they make me so happy. Huh? It's almost a description of what we so-called near-death experience where you have this uh, feeling that you detach yourself from your body and you see what's happening. Huh? And uh, actually it's not nice what's happening because people are discussing what we'll do with him and uh, with his fortune and with his money. But anyway, the, uh, the, the near-death experience, but she described something of that kind. Huh? Like if she was detached from her body and floating in this mid, uh, uh, mid-air like this. Again, always it's an extreme uh, religious experience uh, in each case. She goes more than that, she referred to a sea painting. Of course, the sea, uh, when you think of Aris, is not the sea, it's not the ocean, it's the Great Lake region, and habitually uh, the Lake Superior, uh, where really this is the landscape where where uh, Harris Fine is uh, is real way, and it, they they very often are are built like the one you see here. Uh, um, there's no uh, hindrance in the foreground, or very little, uh, and then you have this light coming from above, always like the revelation. Uh, uh, and uh, crossing all these clouds and all that, and then making this white surface, this shiny surface on the lake. Uh, as it, and I think basically it's that. It is a kind of a huge empty space in which uh, the revelation comes from above, if you want, through this ray of, of light and falling on the, on the water. Uh, but she described uh, one of the paintings she saw there I think it's not this one. Uh, I will just uh, uh, read, read to you what she says and you will see that uh, uh, it's another painting. A heavenly light lay upon one corner, shining peacefully. Three cloud forms, almost straight shaft with light on their tips pointed to it. Across a blue-green sky, a long queer cloud lay lower down, almost on the horizon, but you could move in and on and beyond it. A small purplish round island, then four long simple rock form, purple brown, with the blue sea lapping them. Two warmer green herd forms and some quiet gray form that might be tree trunks in the foreground. And when I said that, I said, oh, this must be rather this painting here. So she described three types of clouds you, and the little light in the corner here. And then these, uh, these island and these four rock formation and the dead tree. Uh, and she's very impressed by that, but this is a very uh, a key picture for understanding Aris. Uh, the revelation of come from above, but the price you have to pay for that is the death of the forest. Uh, and this is, a car doesn't understand that there. Why, I will tell you, because I will tell you a myth, <laughs> not explain that. Giambattista Vico, a great uh, thinker of the 18th century, Imagine how the primitive man have found religion. And he says, at the beginning, we were brutes. Uh, we were kind of people without too much talking and all that. And we were living in the middle of the forest. And then suddenly, these brutes, uh, the, he called them the bestiones, <laughs> not really nice uh, to call people that way. Uh, they, they were in the forest, they never saw the sky. 
And suddenly they hear the thunder after the flood when the, the water recedes and that humidity come and we have clouds again and you hear the thunder. So one of the brightest bestion there climbed a tree and saw the sky for the first time and decided that this is God, this is uh, that speak to us through the thunder and we should destroy the forest to see God more often. Yeah? So uh, this myth, of course it's not true, but this myth is very important in terms of the relationship of, I would say, the occidental man with the forest. Uh, the forest is something that you have to clear in order to put civilization instead. Uh, and in a way, Harris is, is very, very conscious of that. He put dentry in the foreground. Uh, the revelation from above cannot be seen if you are covered with forest. And if you think of this, when you see the forest painting of Emily Carter, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, it will take time for you to understand that, but on, uh, when, when she will uh, go back to the West and begin to create her own world around the, uh, to, to abandon these Indian themes that she had before, she will, in, on the contrary, immerse itself in the forest. And she will not have at all this type of relationship like we see here. But anyway, at the time it was not yet clear to her and she was uh, very uh, uh, interested by this type of picture. And she said, one, I'm longing to go back West and to to resume my work. And what she did first, it is to go back to her Indian picture and try to do them in a more simplified way. Uh, uh, she abandoned the kind of uh, little uh, uh, impressionist type of touch that she had before. She's more bold, it's more simple. You, you see evidently the influence of Harris. Even in the background, for instance, of this picture, uh, we see something of the way, uh, let's say, the trees are, are drawn in Iris here. There, there is, uh, I think we cannot deny, kind of an influence of that kind at that moment. Well, it's just after her trip, she's coming back to uh, Victoria, and she writes to Eric Brown, I just bought tons of, uh, of uh, tube of paint and, and roll of canvas, and I, I want to work, and I want to do something uh, uh, that will reflect the impression I had in my trip. Another picture that she made exactly at the same time is this crying totem. Uh, you see the, uh, the upper figure like this seems to, to be crying. In fact, it's not that. It's a, it's a kind of chief who has a kind of mystical power. He can remove his eyeball during the night and see like this around him, and then he can put them back to see what he's eating. Okay, that's perfect. And what he eats, he has no teeth, and he eats only seal. And of course, poof, at the end, <laughs> after digesting them, you have to spit all the bones and things like that. So that it's a rather a mythical figure than a crying totem. Huh? But it was known as such, and people call it that way, and she, she kept the, this title. Huh? But again, look at the trees in the background, the big clouds and all that. This is more also the a kind of reflection of the influence of Aris Honor. But this will not to stay uh, too long. She also started to work not only from her own previous work, but also from photograph. Uh, like here, it's a good example. Uh, you, if I, you put them aside, you see uh, this totem here is here. Uh, you could see all the correspondence, but also some differences. For instance, the boat here are not in the, in the photography of uh, Monsieur Ménard in 1884. The houses have been transformed a little bit also, and of course all the background is different. Instead of having just the, these trees, you have used big rocks and all that. It gives certainly more, more power to the picture. One of the more famous uh, utilization of photograph that she made is with this famous picture of Blondin Harbor. Uh, that you may have seen reproduced also. It's a National Gallery in Ottawa. It's one of the most important Emilicar uh, picture. Uh, it was based on this photograph. It's a village she never visited it, and was given to her by Monsieur Newcomb that you see here. He took the photo in 1901, and she made the picture in 1930. Uh, the first thing that is striking when you compare both, it is the, dis the complete disparition of people in the picture of uh, Emilicar. And she wanted to reflect that in fact, uh, this corresponds to reality that these village in 1901 maybe was uh, very uh, populous, but uh, 30 years after, there was nobody there. There was, and these work of art was no more there also. They were sold and you may find them in museum or, or private collection. Uh, so that's one thing. And also you, you notice that 
on the wall you have, you had painting and she also suppressed that completely yeah um, monsieur uh, how is called Barry Lord who is a an art historian and, uh, and uh, an acquaintance and somebody that I met, he, he, he says that the figure here um, showed the strength of the native people, their ability to fight back. Barry is a, was at least, I don't know, he still, he was a Marxist and he, he liked this idea of antagonism, let's say. But in fact, it's based on a myth again. Uh, very often these, uh, and the myth is the myth of a competition between two giants. Uh, and it's them that you see represented here. And this is the figure that we're using in potlash uh, um, context and what we call a figure of rivality. Uh, since it tell about the competition between two big chiefs, two big uh, strong men, one was able to tear into a whale. Or with this you have to be a little bit strong to do that and to challenge the other, they were a very appropriate figure for a potlash because that means, look, we are as strong as this man and you are feeble. You are. And the third personage, of course, is the people looking at the two great men fighting to each other. So the, the stronger one is on the foreground. The other one is there uh, showing that he have been defeated by the first one. And then you have in the back. Uh, so uh, I, I suspect that uh, America could know that because Newcomb knew that. We know the story uh, behind the, this figure through Newcomb. So since she got a photo, she may have got the story too and wanted to, uh, to show that. Uh, they are like, they are not welcome. Uh, they are not figure of welcome. They are figure of rivality. Huh? Uh, I think there's a nuance here is interesting. After that, the, um, the Indian team seems to recede more and more from uh, the, uh, the iconography of Emily Carr. Uh, as you know, the, the last subject matter that she was involved with was the forest. And remember what I just told you about the way, uh, the contrast between this type of picture and what we saw in Iris. Huh? In Iris, I says the, the, in the foreground you have dead tree and you have this light coming from heaven. Here you have living tree and no sky to speak about, uh, almost nothing. Huh? And in the middle of this, uh, this tree here, you see like an eye, like, like if there was a watching presence inside of the forest. Huh? And then I think she took that, uh, you see it, it more explicitly in certain of her drawings, like here, where you see peering from the, the, the shape of trees, let's say, some sculpture or some, and then a big high ear. But, but in, the, in the picture, it was called gray, uh, I think she doesn't need anymore this type of direct allusion to the sculpture uh, and where they come from. Huh? She can uh, express the same idea more directly. Huh? And then instead of having this idea that we should be uh, fearful of forests or we should try to detach ourselves from that or destroy them, she have in the contrary the exact opposite and, and she will do it in a very, uh, say very conscious manner. Huh? Uh, for instance, in this one, Hedge of the Forest, she put uh, in the foreground here certain stumps uh, that have been cut and then these slender trees that will grow after uh, the deforestation have, be have become. And I read to you uh, just um, a short paragraph describing uh, her way to uh, how she feels about this cutting of trees and all that. She would say, and it's in, in her journal, hundreds and thousands, it's called. Uh, there is a torn and splintered ridge across the stump I call the screamers. Huh? You know what it is, when you cut a big tree, you start on one side, and then you start from the other side, and when the tree falls, you have in the middle a kind of ridge like this. This, this is what she called the screamer. Huh? When, when the tree falls, what is left there is a kind of this little ridge. These are the honsoun. On sound, last bits, the cry of the tree's heart, wrenching and tearing apart just before she gave that sway and dreadful groan of falling, that dreadful pause while her executioner stepped back with their saws and ax resting and watch. It's a horrible sight to see a tree fell, even now, though the stumps are gray and rotting. As you pass among them, you see their screamers sticking up, out of their own tombstone, as it were. 
they are their own tombstone and they are mourners. Huh? So this is very, very far from the feeling of Iris. Huh? This is really genuinely a America type of approach to the forest. Huh? The, the, the destruction of forest is seen as a catastrophe. Huh? And, uh, she have, and she will insist on that uh, all the time. Let's see the, look at the title of this picture. The scorn as timber, beloved of the sky. Well, you will say, well, here, this is a case in which the sky has a lot of space. I take a lot of space. Yes, but look how the sky is built. Not from above the below, but exactly the opposite. Uh, if you follow the rhythm of the line there, they start from the ground and go up and up. Uh, it's exactly the opposite than Harris. Harris, the rev la révélation vient en haut. Uh, the revelation comes from above. Uh, theosophy. Uh, psh, you have M Mrs. Blavatsky who tells you what to believe. Uh, and uh, in, in the case of Carr, the revelation comes from the ground uh, and goes maybe toward, like here, this kind of slender type of, uh, of uh, trees going up. But it's exactly the opposite. And of course, this is much after her, her encounter with, with Harris. Uh, we are like 10 years later, and she, um, I would say, matured these uh, ideas and, and find her own way. Huh? Uh, sometimes the, the title are very clear, reforestation. You cannot be clear about their intention here, uh, where you see, okay, whole trees who have been saved there and the little one who, who start to, uh, uh, to uh, occupy, I would say, this portion of the land where the, the whole trees have been cut. Uh, uh, she will have a little pine also, meaning the one who start again, then and, uh, and always the proportion between sky and, and what we see is the opposite of Harris. Uh, instead of a big, big space above and a little dead tree on the, on the foreground or some rocks, you have the trees are occupied almost all the space. Uh, uh, here even you have no sky. Uh, you are completely immersed in the forest. It's black and dark and uh, you don't need any more uh, the, even the presence of the sky. If there is light, like in this case, it seems to come from the ground. Huh? The, the light doesn't come from above, but try to illuminate a little bit to, to, uh, to find its way uh, through the, the, the trunks and the, uh, and the under bush, let's say. Like the same here. You see the, the, the ray of light that you have here behind the big uh, trunk here is in the ground. It's not from above. Uh, the, the, the sky is covered completely. Uh, and uh, I finish with this painting, uh, which almost a kind of a, uh, abstract translation of her feeling about the forest, because now you don't see trees, sky, and things like that, but just a movement that she described beautifully. He says, a main movement must run through the picture. The transition must be easy, not jerky. None must be out of the step in the march, on and on and deeper and deeper with the soul of the things burrowing into its depth and intensity till that thing is a reality to us and speak one grand inaudible word, God. The movement and the direction of lines and plane shall express some attribute of God, power, peace, strength, serenity, joy. The movement should be so great the picture will rock and sway together carrying the artist and after him the looker with it, catching up with the soul of the things and marching on all together. I think it's the best, the best commentary you could make of this uh, specific picture. Yeah. She's a wonderful writer also. I, don't, my, uh, I cannot read this properly. My English is not at the, this level, but uh, she's a wonderful writer. So, so certain, she wrote a lot about her, uh, her trips and, and everything and, uh, and she expressed her beautifully. Uh, so there, there's no doubt. So the so you see the uh, what I if I summarize what I wanted to to say. Okay, it's true that this encounter with Harris was very important for America. She says it's the pivot around which her whole life turned. But uh, she never became um, a mere imitator of him. Uh, she was strong enough to find her own way, and even ideologically, uh, which was more difficult in a way because. In a way, you could disagree in terms of form, but uh, being influenced in terms of, uh, of uh, ideas. Huh? And even ideologically, I think through her picture, you see that she felt something else than uh, Harris felt. And with the time, I think the theosophy of Harris became a little bit too dogmatic for her. Huh? 
And she didn't need that. She had more, uh, she needed a more emotive type of, uh, of approach to religious uh, thought. And uh, she find it, I think, in her last work uh, in this uh, forest theme. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you today. Uh, next time, okay, we will see next time. I will show you. <laughs> <laughs>